coming from Corey, and I'm like, oh, man, what a wuss, you know. But uh, anyhow, praise the Lord. God is so good, and He keeps getting gooder every day. <clears throat> Actually, He never changes, but our revelation of Him becomes greater and greater and greater. Uh, so, welcome, welcome, welcome. You should be welcoming me. You've been here. But I'm so glad to be here. Uh, question first. Did everyone get one of these little mini handouts? Huh? Romans Road and the Old and the New. Cole doesn't have one? <gasps> What's your name? <laughs> okay, Ruthie. Uh, Cole, anybody else? Oh, okay. Here you go. My suggestion is put it in the front cover of your Bible. You're going to go to this and go to this and you're going to go, wow, and you're going to get revelated and you're going to go, wow. It's just a simple little thing that I just wanted to share with you. That's E.W. Kenyon didn't write it. Neither did I. I copied it. But um, it's, it's just a nice little handout, and I just wanted to share it with everybody. Make sure you got it, and it'll bless you. Um, <clears throat> great day, huh? It's always a great day. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice, shovel snow, and be glad in it. <coughs> Beautiful day. Uh, I just want <clears> to <throat> thank Robert and Megan. You, you guys inspire me, man. I'll tell you what. I just, I just love it. So God bless you. Ah, oh, tremendous, tremendous. It's good to inspire one another, you know, as we're all members of the body of Christ. So I'm going to ask you couple questions. One is, are you enjoying the studies in the Bible in light of redemption? E.W. Kenya, are you? I'll tell you what, I've been, I have been walking with the Lord for decades, and this thing is just blowing me away ev all the time, all the time, when I'm not praying in tongues. I'll tell you what, ever since last week, I, I did a lot before praying the Spirit, and now it's like I never stop, you know. It's like, oh, start praying, you know, I forgot. And uh, it, it is so good to be obedient, you know, to, to the Lord and, and, and to the Lord's Word as we get it. But uh, it's, it's very exciting. So uh, uh, I hope you are learning things. Uh, I'm learning so much, I just, <laughs> I just, I can't even talk sometimes. It gets so exciting. Um, uh, after, you know, j just being with the Lord for so many years, um, I have never seen revelation like this. I have never seen this kind of revelation before um, as we're learning it through the Kenyan courses and that. And I ask myself, why not? I've heard no one teach this stuff. So I thank God for this day and this hour and um, as I was telling you before, everything happens at a time for a purpose, God's purpose and His appointed time. And I really believe that, uh, and I know we are in the last days. The end of the book says, come quickly, Lord Jesus. We are in the last days. This is no accident. We are here. This is no accident. We're getting these kind of tools and weapons and guidance systems in our hands to do God's work. Um, so I, I just, I thank the Lord for what He is doing, and uh, I'm just so thankful to be a part of it, you know, just to be a part of it, to be with all of you, uh, you know, and we've just recently, you know, a lot of us met, and I thank God for each and every one of you. Um, so uh, uh, these teachings are just, uh, they're changing my life. You know, I've read the book for decades, um, uh, and and, wow, now, it's like, who rewrote this book? That's what I feel like when I pick it up. It's a whole new book. And, and what gets me is I'll, I'll be reading through like in the New Testament, and before, you know, you think, oh, I know what that means. No, you don't. You don't know what it means, and I'll be sitting there. That's what that means. All this time, I know that's what that means. Or I'll go over here and I'll look, and I'll be... That's what it's saying. That's what, oh, God, thank you. You know, you just, it's like revelation. It just begins to open up to you. 
And that's what's happening um, with the things we're learning now. And um, it's amazing. Uh, when God revealed his revelation to Paul, the Pauline uh, epistles, you know, we have them today. And the revelation in there is so deep uh, and is so powerful. And that's basically, that's what we're studying. Of course, we are... Uh, in this particular course book, we're going on redemption, okay, throughout the Bible, you know. Uh, and in the meantime, all this other stuff is just coming in on the sides and that. And it's, and it's so wonderful um, as, as we are getting the revelation, as Paul gave it forth as the Holy Spirit. I can just imagine what it was like, you know, when he said, I knew a man, you know, about 13 years ago or 14, whatever. Uh, in the body, out of the body, I don't know. And he saw stuff he couldn't tell. And, whoo, we're getting it. We are getting it today. We're getting these revelations. Um, and it's really, it's great. It's great. It's exciting. So um, I, I, I hope and pray that you're, you're just opening your hearts up as you do this. Don't let this be a, um, a fruitless labor, okay? But we're on a journey we're on a journey with God. And as He takes us forth, every one of us will go a different path. Okay? We'll all go a different path. You'll meet, meet people that, you know, the other ones won't, and you'll know and all different ones, and you'll have opportunities as the Holy Spirit opens doors to you. And that's what it's all about. When opportunities open, you are ready to share Jesus. We're ready to snatch Him out of the fire. Um, okay. Okay. Um, it's just so great. I wanted to do something today just a little tiny bit different. I wanted to do a couple things in our book. Uh, I want to go over a couple of, I'm seeing as the questions come in and you're answering questions, I'm seeing a couple of little things um, that I want to go over to, uh, I hope, help you with. Um, I don't want to say there's mistakes in that, but... Um, I just want to encourage you when you write your answers, try to keep them very simple. Very simple, you know. That's when you want to be a sponge. And, and, and you know, you don't want to be a scholar. We don't want, you know, just get the answers across very simply. If you have your books, okay, uh, we want to go to page 119. And I just want to show you a couple things that... I'm seeing recurring things in, in the answers in that, okay? And it was just, give you a little helper here. Um, on 119, uh, question 10, okay? And it says, what does the mitre signify on the head of the high priest? Okay, what does the mitre signify? So if you back up one page, you don't even have to turn a page. It's right there on 118, the mitre. Okay. Um, let me read this to you. Uh, because a lot of people, they picked up something. It was like, and I want to show you. It's like somebody threw a curve here to us. And it says, um, the word mitre is used for the headdress of the high priest. It is derived from a verb signifying to roll or wind around, possibly intimating that the high priest's mitre was wound around his head. And so a lot of the answers that came in had to do with this. And if you see the question, it says, what does the mitre signify? See the word signify? And you go over to 118. And it says about the mitre, it is derived from a verb signifying. And a lot of people tied those two words together, thinking that the answer was there, and it wasn't. Okay, that was just a word they used. The mitre is derived from a verb signifying. Okay, so actually, if you go right down to the next little paragraph, it says the mitre covering the head of the high priest was a type of, of his being subject to God. Bingo, there's the answer right there. Okay? Um, and that he was always supposed to be standing in the presence of God. Now, the mitre is what? On the head, a covering. And it represented 
that God was his covering. Okay, so he was subject to God because God was his covering. Okay, so see that little, little trick word there, signify, and everybody, oh, signify. And I got one answer after the other after the other. And so I just wanted to tell you, and we're going to do one more. When you read the questions, okay, read them carefully. Watch the wording in them. See what they're asking for. And then just, you know, find your answer. And they're not usually hard to find, although they're getting a little tougher. <laughs> um, just... Uh, and then keep them simple. And that'll help you in your understanding. You know, don't write all this stuff. You know, you know just nice, simple answer. Okay, uh, page 136. Does that help you a little bit on just, just how you're thinking about how you're doing your answers? Because this whole thing with Revelation hitting this gets a little heavy, you know, to me anyhow. It's good. Um, on page... 136 and question 2, it says, During the Old Testament period, toward what event is God working and why? Okay, key words, what event? Let's go back to page 130. <clears throat> what event? Was God working toward and why? <clears throat> okay, under note to the students, the little second paragraph there, it says, We have seen that redemption demands the incarnation. Therefore, God is working toward the time when the redemption shall become a possibility through the incarnation of his Son. Okay, a lot of people put the answer is redemption, and that's not an event. That's a happening kind of a thing. The event is the incarnation. You can't have redemption unless God comes incarnate first. Jesus shows up, and redemption then will come through him. Okay? So, yeah, okay, I just, <clears throat> just a little helper for you. Read the questions and see what they're looking for. A lot of people on that hit on redemption. And it says, no, it's actually he was working toward, he had to come to earth. He had to come as Jesus Christ. Okay, that's the event. Why? Well, man had to be redeemed in the next sentence from Satan's bondage in order to become a child of God. So we have the event as the incarnation. Why? We're getting set free from Satan. Okay? Hope that helps you. Just a couple little, you know, just something to help you think it through. And maybe sometimes, you know, they come in a, in a certain fashion. The questions will come to you. Well, anyhow, <clears throat> that's just a little natural helper there. On these questions, just um, take your time with them if you can. Read carefully. And uh, I know you're just going to knock it out of the park. <laughs> Okay, so now what I want to do very simply is I just want to go back to the table of contents and uh, we're not going through details of what you read. You're absorbing that because you're all sponges, right? right? Not scholars. Sponges soaking it up into your heart. Okay, <clears throat> and uh, we had 19 through 24. 19 was the life of the incarnate one. The incarnation of God as a man was Jesus Christ. He's the incarnate one. 20, the reason he came. Yeah, you can just read it there. Uh, um, he came uh, for our redemption. We're getting saved. He's redeeming us and getting us back to the Father. And then um, 21 was our identification with Christ. Wasn't that good? All the different ways we are identified identified with Christ is absolutely amazing the details that they brought out okay and then um, 22 God's two creations of course Adam and Jesus the natural the spiritual we see the two creations very good study and the last two I really had a hard time doing because I just I couldn't get my breath it was so good the name of Jesus was 
Awesome, so awesome. The name of Jesus. And then 24 was um, the Word. And we know that the Word is God's revelation to man. It's the only way we find out about God is through the book. <laughs> through the revelation of the Word, the Bible. He gave it. So we filter it through our natural processes. Okay? And it gets down in our heart and the Holy Spirit takes over. And we take it in the Spirit and we receive the revelation <clears throat> from God. And that's basically what we went over. We're not going to um, belabor that at all anymore. I'm kind of wrestling. <laughs> you know, I want to share something or not. I'm gonna, uh, I had a few points picked out. Um, just uh, some, some uh, thoughts and high points that jumped out at me, and you probably saw lots of good stuff in there as you went through. Uh, but it was really good. Uh, like on page 180, and you don't have to turn there, okay, that throughout history, God was striving toward one goal, a new creation. That's on page 180. That's us. He wanted to have a new creation in us so that we could be set free from the bonds of the evil one. Okay, so throughout history, and all of this that we're going through, man, we came through Egypt, out of the garden, through all the, all the way down, he's got one goal. He's got one goal, <clears throat> and that was the new creation. Here's another thought. Uh, and, and this gets me, I'm still not sure. <laughs> about this. This is really good. Have you read in there, I'm sure you have, about when they said something is done legally and then vitally? Man, I'm scratching my head on it. It's so good. You know, and, um, and, and I just wrote down some uh, uh, little miniature definitions of um, legally just kind of means as if. It's like when you're not saved. When something happened to Christ and it was done for our sake, it was legally done in us, legally. Okay, but once we get saved, then it becomes vital. It's as if it actually happened to us. When he hung on the cross and we're born again, it's as if we were hanging on the cross, but he took our place. Vital is like it really happened. Legally is like it's getting ready to. And I, I just... Um, <clears throat> I, I thought that that legally and vitally, I'm going to be looking at that for a long time because it's, it's really good. It's really good. Um, very interesting note as we move along here. Just got a couple more. Uh, interesting note on Galatians 2.20. <laughs> as he pointed out, where the King James Version says, I am crucified with Christ. That's a translational error, okay, where it says, I am. It should have been, I have been. I have been. You know, it's like, I am, it's happening now. No, I have been. You know, when Jesus was crucified, I was there. When I'm born again, then it becomes vital. That's legal and vital. You see what I mean? But I was like, woo. That's really good. I didn't do that because I've quoted that for years. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, you know, it's not a, and that, but, um, and then he says, hey, that's a, he's pointing out a lot of stuff that, and I'll tell you what, if you go into your strong, exhaustive concordance, uh -huh, and you dig these things out, he's spot on. Yeah. He's right on target with these truths, you know. So it's not, I am crucified. And if you have any other modern language um, uh, versions, Translations, they'll probably say, like the New King James Version does not say, I am crucified. It says, I have been. It's right there. Or any of the other ones. Check them out. Interesting. I just thought that was kind of interesting. And, and, and when I looked in the Strong's and, and the, the first one, you know, it went right down the line. And, and it was right there. It's right there. How did it get down to the third line and pull that up and put it for their meaning? I don't want to get into that. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Another neat note from page 186. 
Under the name of Jesus, it is called a weapon. It is called a weapon, the weapon, the name of Jesus. Now, I'm going to share with you what I didn't know if I was going to share with you or not. The name of Jesus. One of the things that we've learned in this course is that we have all authority over all the realms of darkness. All authority over everything Satan and his cohorts and everything have. We have authority in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, I just want to share just a little something out of my life that happens. Uh, And I found as I've been teaching this course, it's uh, the frequency has picked up and the intensity is the attacks from the evil one. You know, and you know he loves to come in the night. And he loves to come when it's dark. And this is not to scare anything. This is just what it is. But, you know, Jesus wins anyhow. But what happens to me when I'm sleeping is I'll just be sleeping. And all of a sudden, something will come up and grab my feet. And I mean, (laughs) one of those, you know. (sighs) Well, that happens a lot, and I just get up and rebuke it, and I just, oh, I get so, and I just rise up in the spirit, I get so angry. But the other night, I don't know if I should do this with this mic on, but anyway, I was laying there on my back, um, I'm sound asleep, and all of a sudden, it goes like, bam, right on my chest, both sides, something hit me just like that, boom. <laughs> and I woke up like that, and I sat straight up in the bed, And something rose up inside of me. I come up out of that bed and I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I bind you, Satan, in every cohort of yours. Everything in the power of darkness. I take authority over you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Get out of my house. And I have found out that I can can stop all this from happening. If, before I go to bed, I do it then. I'm seriously, it works. If I forget to do it, I boom, in the middle of the night, I'll get hit. Not all the time, but way too often. Okay? And so then, if I, I, I was so tired, I'm ready to go to bed. I'm on the edge of the bed, and the wife's there, and she's down, and she's not asleep. <laughs> and I'll just, I'll go through it. I'll just take authority right then. I said, Satan, in the name of Jesus, I bind you and every one of your cohorts and all your powers in the name of Jesus Christ. I said, I want you under my feet right now in the name of Jesus. Because he's, he's ashes under our feet. That's Malachi 4.3, if you never knew that. Malachi 4.3, he's ashes under our feet. And I put him under my feet. I take authority. I bind his powers, throw him out. And then I wake up the next morning. It's pretty neat. So... The name of Jesus is a weapon. It is the name that is above everything in creation. Everything is under the name of Jesus. The Father gave him that. Gave that name so that it would be the authority over all creation. And that's pretty cool. (laughs) That's pretty cool. So just, you know, we don't have to take junk from him. We don't. But he tries. And he's so stupid. He never quits. He keeps coming back. He gets beat up and he keeps coming back. And he keeps coming back. But all he's trying to do is to steal, kill, and destroy. He's going to steal your sleep. He's going to make you tired. Remember Daniel 7.25? Wear out the saints. He wears out the saints. Nothing. He's got nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun and nothing new in his bag of tricks. Three weapons to steal, kill, and destroy. And he just keeps coming back. So, Uh, we have the authority in the name of Jesus Christ. You don't have to put up with any of that. You can send him packing every time. He has to bow, him and all of his cohorts, because we win. Jesus did it all. Now we're vitally involved. (laughs) Okay, one last thing um, is that uh, the thing I, I found very interesting was the, uh, the, little, the, the part about the mental ascent of people. The mental ascent. People that think they're saved. Uh, he brought it out really well. Because I have heard that for so many years, I can't even count. Oh, yeah, it must have been mental ascent or whatever. You know, Was he really saved? Oh, he didn't live like it, you know. But what happens is they'll go through, as he brought out, go through all the motions. 
say everything, agree with the word, da -da 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 -da, and that's it. There's no action in what they do. They talk it, they don't do it. And they mentally ascend to salvation, and they mentally ascend, ascend to being a Christian. Okay? The mental ascent, wow. It's one of Satan's weapons today. Mental ascent. Okay, you might run into people that, you know, they'll talk it, this, that, the other. But they're not doing anything. There's no action. They're ascending in their, in, in their mentality to thinking they're okay. And they may well be one of the ones that Jesus will say to them someday. Depart from me. I never knew you. Whew, that's scary stuff. That's scary stuff. But you're going to run into people that are in this mental ascent uh, category. You know, it is utterly, utterly dangerous. It is so subtle. It can look right. You think people are saved. And they may have mentally ascended to this position. Whereas we have received it with open heart, been forgiven, washed by the blood of the Lamb. We're born again, spirit-filled. Uh, and it's real. And they may look close, but the mental ascent is deadly. It is deadly. So just, you know, be aware. Keep your eyes open. <laughs> you may see it. You may see it. So I'm about done. I just want all of you to continue to be sponges and not scholars. All of this that just ask the Holy Spirit, Quicken this to my heart, Lord. I want you more now than I did yesterday, but not as much as tomorrow. I want you more and more, Lord. Help me in this. Help me, Holy Spirit, to just receive and soak up your truth, you know. Um, and just, I just want to get closer to him all the time, you know, um, and love him more. I, I tell you, this, um, this walk in the Lord this walk in Christ is just, it's, it is so wonderful. It is so wonderful. It just, I deal with people in the world every day, and I see where they are, and, and my heart just cries. You know, just cries and weeps for them, because they don't know. They, um, Satan has blinded their minds, lest they see the glorious gospel of Christ. They're blinded, so it's our mission. You know, just go out there, be a sponge, soak it up, process it, and let the Holy Spirit bring it out. Live it, and go get them. Yeah. Go get them. Pull them out of the fire. Mm -hmm. Do anything you can as, as the Spirit of God directs you. You know, don't go out on your own. <laughs> as we learned from Brother Ron, it was great. Wasn't that great stuff? If you were here, it was no, awesome. So, praise the Lord. Be a sponge, not a scholar. Yeah. Love you. God bless you. Amen. Amen. God is good. The Bible instructs Christians to go into all the world and preach the gospel. But in our Western world, people are not responding to the gospel today as they did in the past. So what has changed? What we're going to find out in this session is that there's a big difference between an Acts 2 type culture and an Acts 17 one. And our Western world today has become much more like an Acts 17 type culture. How do we reach such people with the message of the gospel? Well, the Bible instructs us how to do that. We're going to learn how to effectively preach the gospel to people today.
Our heart at Answers in Genesis is evangelism. As I've often said to people, there's no point in converting people to be creationists because creationists will uh, end up in hell just like an atheist if they don't believe and trust in the Creator as Lord and Savior. And so our heart is to preach the gospel and see people one to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in this particular session, I want to share with you my heart concerning evangelism and how do we evangelize a secularized culture? In Psalm 11.3, we read, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And I reminded people about a barn, a barn that had a foundation that was collapsing. And when the foundation collapsed, the structure came down. And I said, that collapsing barn to me represents the collapse of Christian morality, the Christian worldview in our Western world. And certainly in America, the greatest Christianized nation on earth, as we see those moral issues like gay marriage and abortion, and we see Christian symbols being thrown out of public places, we see the culture changing, and really that's what that collapsing barn is symbolic of. And to explain what's happened, we understand that there are really only two religions in the world. You either start with God's word or you start with man's word. And that was the choice right back there in Genesis chapter 3. Trust God's word, don't eat of the tree. Or what was the temptation? You can become as gods. You can decide truth for yourself. No, trust yourself. It's man who determines truth. And on the basis of those two different religions, two different starting points, starting with God's word or man's word, we have two different worldviews. One, a worldview of Christian absolutes. The other, a worldview of moral relativism. But what's happened in our Western world, in this era of history, there's been an attack on the foundation, the foundation of the authority of the Word of God. This nation started primarily with uh, founding fathers, many of whom were Christians, but they built their morality on the Bible. Its starting point was really, in that sense, the Bible. That's why a Christian worldview permeated uh, this culture. But we've had generations now, right through our Western world, have been told that the history in the Bible, particularly that history in Genesis 1 to 11, is not true. Evolution is true. Millions of years is true. That history in Genesis 1 to 11 is not true. And subsequent generations have started to recognize if that history in Genesis is not true, then neither is the gospel that's based in that history. And what we see happening in our Western world is the collapse of Christian morality and increase in moral relativism because there's been a change foundationally from God's word to man's word. In this culture, in the education system, in the court system, in the government, and sadly, even in much of the church, the starting point has changed from God's word to man's word. And we're seeing a change in this nation, a change from a predominantly Christian worldview to one now that's predominantly secular with moral relativism pervading the culture. And I summed it up with this castle diagram. And that is that here's the problem. We have the foundation of God's word and the structure of Christianity and the gospel doctrines built on that. Foundation of man's word, secular humanism, moral relativism that comes out of that. There's been an attack. The secularists have really attacked God's word. But that attack has occurred ever since Genesis 3, really. God's words come under attack since Genesis 3. But in this era of history, it's particularly been in Genesis 1 to 11. Much of the church has even said, we don't really need that part of the Bible or it doesn't matter. You don't have to take it as literal history. We'll keep the rest of God's word and keep that structure. But like that barn, if we don't have the whole foundation, the structure will collapse. And then we look up here and we say, well, look at all the problems in the culture. But they're not the problems. In essence, they're the symptoms of the problem. And... For all the millions of dollars that the church, God's people, have spent in this nation trying to fight those issues, ultimately, from a big picture perspective in the nation, it hasn't worked. And why not? Because, you see, the secularists captured generations of hearts and minds, changed their hearts and minds in regard to what they believe about the Word of God, to believe it's man that should be a starting point, thus changed their worldview, which changed the culture. And what's much of the church tried to do? We tried to go in there and change the culture. But the Bible doesn't say go into all the world and change the culture. The Bible says go into all the world and what? Preach the gospel and make disciples. In other words... Here's the thing, the secularists understand if you capture the hearts and minds of generations of children and give them a different foundation and, and therefore a different worldview, they'll change the culture. What should the church be doing? We should have been raising up generations standing on the authority of the Word of God who knew how to defend the faith, who would be the salt and light in the culture. But instead, the secularists have captured them and we've helped that change. We've let them do it. Basically, we handed our children, generations of children, over to the world and, and we've said, you can believe what the world teaches, that's okay, as long as you trust in Jesus, Johnny. 
And eventually, what do we see happening? Right now, the statistics are at least two-thirds of young people, when they reach the, uh, the college age in our churches, are walking away from the church. And if this continues, we're going to lose this culture. And we're losing it right now. Now, we, you might say, okay, well then what we need to do is capture their hearts and minds. That's right, that's what we need to do. The secularists know, capture their hearts and minds and we'll capture the culture. Well, we need to go out there and preach the gospel and, 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 and see it, 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 these people saved and wonder the Lord to build their thinking on the Bible, have a Christian worldview so that they will change the culture. That's right. But then I'm going to ask you this. Okay, I'm going to go and preach the gospel. What is the gospel? You might say, oh, well, the gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ died on the cross, raised from the dead. That's true. That's true. The gospel is the good news that Jesus died on the cross, raised from the dead. But isn't it also true that you can't understand the good news of the gospel unless you understand the bad news in Genesis? The bad news concerning a perfect world marred by sin, that the first man, Adam, rebelled, and thus sin came into the world, and thus death is a consequence. That's why we need a saviour. That's why Jesus Christ stepped into history. In other words, the history in Genesis 1 to 11 is foundational to understanding the good news. Think about this for a moment. Imagine you were in a church where in that particular church they said, we don't believe Genesis, doesn't matter anyway, but we want you to go out and evangelize the culture. We want to evangelize the generations of kids in this culture. So go out there and tell them about Jesus, but don't mention Genesis. You're not allowed to mention Genesis because we don't believe Genesis. Uh, but go out there and tell them about Jesus. Okay. You sinner, you sinner. You're a sinner. You, you, you need the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm a sinner. Why am I a sinner? Because you're a sinner. Where'd that come from? Don't worry about that. Just believe it. You're a sinner. Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. Oh, he did? Yeah. Why do you do that? Because of your sin. Well, where did sin come from? Don't worry about that. Just, just believe it. How do you preach the gospel without that history in Genesis 1 to 11? I mean, if you read 1 Corinthians 15, Romans 5, when Paul's talking about the gospel, uh, the, the good news, and talking about the resurrection, and talking about the last Adam, he's going back to Genesis, because that history there is foundational to all of that. And you know, as a communicator, the first thing you have to um, make sure of is that the words you use, they understand and define them the same way you do. You say, well, that's obvious. Oh, is it, is it really? I mean, do people really think about that? See, I come originally from Australia, and we speak English. Americans speak mm, sort of English, a form of it anyway. But one of the things I learned was we can use the same words in the English language, but in a different culture they can have different definitions, and so you will not communicate if you don't understand that. I remember one stage when we first moved over here to America, I told somebody I had a flat battery. A flat battery? And they wanted to know if I ran over it. I said, no, I left the lights on. He said, oh, you have a dead battery. Dead? It wasn't alive. How could it die? I... You know, you're not going to communicate if you don't understand the words they use in those situations. And of course, then there's the embarrassing ones, like uh, at the time, this was a number of years ago, of course, when we had little children, and somebody said, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm nursing our baby. <laughs> then there was this silence for a moment on the end of the phone. You know, I was talking on the telephone. Nursing a baby. Yes. Oh. <laughs> See, in Australia, nursing a baby means holding a baby. So I, I was just saying, I'm holding the baby. Over here, I found out it doesn't mean that. <laughs> you know, if you're going to say to somebody the word God, if they don't understand the word the way you do, you're not going to communicate. Or if you say sin, and they don't understand sin the way you do, you're not going to communicate. You see, when I'm thinking about communicating the gospel, I like to think of communicating the gospel in regard to three basic aspects. First of all, the foundational aspect. There's the foundational history that Christ is creator, sin entered the world, death is a result of sin. Actually, that's foundational to understanding why the Son of God stepped into history to be Jesus, the God-man, to die on a cross because death was a penalty for sin, raised from the dead. That's the power of the gospel. And we also know it's a groaning world now because of sin. So one day there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth to come. The foundational knowledge, the power of the gospel, and the hope of the gospel. If I can say this, I, I want us to think carefully about this for a moment. I would suggest to you that most of the church, in fact, in our Western world, in fact, around the world, concentrates mainly on the power and the hope of the gospel, not the foundational aspects. For instance, there was a, a, a series of books, you know, w w when we talk about eschatology, now as soon as I start talking about eschatology, some people get nervous, you're going to come out and tell us a particular view of eschatology and so on. don't worry, I'm not going to do that, because I, I, I just never deal with controversial issues, and so you don't have to worry about that. But 
there was a particular book series uh, out uh, called the Left Behind series. H how many of you purchased maybe the Left Behind series or even read the Left Behind series? Yeah, there's hands all over the rooms. And you know, millions of Americans purchased that series. I'm not saying you should have, shouldn't have, it's just a matter of history, okay? But you know, millions did purchase that series, which is about a particular view of eschatology, but most of those millions didn't buy creation books. Why? Do you know one of the things I found in the church, and I found this in America, and I, I believe it's true in a, in a Western world, people in the church seem more interested in end times than in the beginning. In fact, one of the things I've noticed in America is that there are many churches to become a member of a church, you have to agree to a particular view of eschatology for that particular church. Now, I'm not saying a church shouldn't have a particular view of eschatology. I mean, eschatology is important too. But you, you have to have a particular, have to agree to a particular view of eschatology. But when it comes to Genesis, as long as you believe God created, why is it we put an emphasis on you must have a particular view of eschatology, but when it comes to Genesis, you can believe in millions of years, evolution doesn't matter, we're not sure what it means, as long as you believe God created eschatology, oh, you've got to have a particular view. Think about that for a moment. Now, I, I do that for this reason. You see, one of the things that I was asked once when I was on radio, it was a Presbyterian minister actually, and he said to me, now you agree that the church can have different views of eschatology. There's pre-mill, R-mill, post-mill, and so on. I said, oh yeah. And he said, and there's different views of Genesis, theistic evolution, gap theory, day-age theory, and so on. And I said, yeah. And he said, well, it's the same thing. I said, no, it's not. He said, why not? I said, because except for some extreme views, of eschatology, for the, for the main views of eschatology, like pre-mill, post-mill, R-mill, you know, in most instances, really people are, are, are looking at Scripture, they have a high view of Scripture, the authority of Scripture, and they're trying to argue from Scripture, you know, understanding Israel, Daniel, Ezekiel, Revelation, and so on, and looking at Scripture, and, 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 and trying to come to some conclusions there. But the reason that people have different views of Genesis is because they're starting outside of the Bible with the secular views of this age and reinterpreting Genesis and coming up with those different positions to impose the idea of millions of years and so on on the Bible. And so in that sense, if we stand back and think about it, here's a problem. We often find in the church in America, we're prepared to take a particular view of eschatology and say that's important, but when it comes to Genesis, it doesn't matter. And yet, I would suggest to you that it's because we're not taking a particular stand on Genesis, we're actually unlocking that door to undermine biblical authority in a way that different views of eschatology, by and large, are not. Think about that for a moment. Because, you see, when you're taking the pagan religion of the age and using that to, to reinterpret Genesis... That's different than arguing from Scripture and trying to come to some conclusions about things. You're taking ideas outside the Bible and deliberately changing the Word of God. I think it's a massive problem. And I think it's really symptomatic of the fact that the church, by and large, does not understand the foundational issues in our culture and have helped that foundational change. 1 Corinthians 1.23 we read this. We preach Christ crucified under the Jews a stumbling block, but under the Greeks foolishness. I want to look at some big picture aspects here tonight regarding the preaching of the gospel. The preaching of the cross was foolishness to the Greeks, but what to the Jews? Stumbling block. What to the Greeks? Foolishness. I want to look at this in a particular way. We're going to look at two sermons. Two sermons where the gospel was preached, number one to the Jews, number two to the Greeks. I want to look at those, Peter taking the gospel to the Jews, Paul taking the gospel to the Greeks. I want to stand back, look at it from a big picture perspective and apply it to our culture in this era of history. And you know, when I do that, I have people afterwards who tell me, it was like a light bulb going off in my head and I, and I sat there and thought, how come we've never seen this before and it's so obvious? When we go to Acts chapter 2, we have Peter here on the day of Pentecost preaching a very powerful sermon. But you can imagine, you know, he's very bold. You can imagine maybe standing on the temple steps or whatever as, as they're coming. And, and basically what he said was this, to paraphrase it. You crucified the Son of God. 
You nailed the Messiah on the cross. You need to repent of your sin. Look what you've done. And God raised him from the dead. And you know, when they heard this, as we read in Acts 2, they were cut to the heart and said, you know, what, what shall we do? And Peter went on to say, repent and so on. And you know what happened? The Bible uh, tells us when, when they were told to be saved and so on, that 3,000 souls were saved. And you say, wow, wouldn't I like to see a crusade like that in my area uh, this week? We used to see crusades like that. We used to see evangelistic campaigns like that. We, we, we've seen great revivals in America, in, in the East in the past, and other places. There's been great revivals in the past. Over in England and, and, and across the United Kingdom and other places in Europe, there's been times where there's been great revivals. But people, we don't see those sort of things today. In fact, I also suggest this to you. Even some of the big evangelistic crusades of the past where, where thousands were, were truly converted and they touched the cultures that, that, uh, that they were ministering to, we don't see the same sort of responses today. In fact, most of those who go to such evangelistic crusades already have a church background. Many of those who go forward are for recommitment. It's a different sort of response today. So here's what we have to ask ourselves. Oda, okay, so Peter preached this message of the gospel, I call it the Acts 2 approach to evangelism. And I want to say this, I would suggest to you that most of what we do in our churches today, our evangelistic campaigns, even our Easter pageants, Christmas pageants, our Sunday school material, Bible study material, youth group material, whatever it is, is basically an Acts 2 approach to evangelism. And what was this Acts 2 approach? Who was Peter really preaching to? Well, he was preaching to mainly Jews or those convinced of or very familiar with the Jewish religion. Let me ask you a question. At that stage in their history, did they believe in God? When Peter said to that group of people, God, did he have to define God or could he assume they were thinking of the God of creation, the God that he uh, understood? He didn't have to define God, did he? If he said sin, you're, you're sinners, did he have to define sin? They had the law of Moses. They knew what sin was. Sin was idolatry, taking the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Sin was stealing, murder, adultery. They knew what sin was. They didn't have a problem with the foundational knowledge. They didn't have a problem with that history in Genesis. They believed in Adam and Eve in the fall, by and large. They had the right starting point, which put them on the right road, but their stumbling block was the message of the cross. And I like to put it this way. Peter was preaching to people who already had a foundation to understand the gospel. It'd be like coming in to build a beautiful auditorium like this and somebody already put the foundation there. I remember when they were building the Creation Museum and it was just a piece of property first of all and then they seemed to spend months, I don't know what they were doing, they were digging holes and having fun. They were laying the foundation. I thought, this is going to take forever. And suddenly one day I went there and the day before I didn't see anything above ground and that, then that day I suddenly saw all the steel structure going up. Once the foundation's there, the structure can go up very quickly. Peter was coming into a group that had the foundation. So from a human perspective, he didn't have to deal with the foundational aspects. He had to deal with the structure that Jesus is the Messiah. To me, that's analogous to this. In 1959, when I was a little boy, very little boy, very, 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 very little boy, in 1959 in Australia, a very famous evangelist came to Australia. What was his name? Billy Graham. Now again, I'm only talking about this from a perspective of history. I know that people can have different theological views and different issues and so on, but this is from a perspective of history. There is no doubt in Australia's history it's, it's said that those early crusades in 59 in Sydney and Melbourne that attracted thousands and thousands of people actually touched the culture in a way that's never happened since. In fact, it's been said this is the closest Australia ever came to revival. Australia's never had revival. I mean, I know that Americans pride themselves on the fact that their founding fathers had great convictions. I tell people our founding fathers had great convictions. Um, but they were convictions of a different sort, and they even went to jail for their convictions, if you can understand that. But you see, what was his message? It was mainly an Acts 2 message. It was sort of, if you like, a simple, basic presentation of the power and the hope of the gospel. You're a sinner, trust in Jesus. He died on the cross for you. You need to put your faith and trust in him. And you know what? People were truly converted. He came back and did some other crusades and so on. But you know what's interesting? Those sorts of crusades today don't touch the culture in Australia. In fact, even if they have such, most of those who go forward are already for, just for recommitment. 
Why was there such a difference in 1959 and the early 60s than today? You know, when I was a little boy back then, went to school, my father was a principal of schools in Australia, and at that stage in our history, they had prayer on assembly before they went in to the classroom, and they even recited the Lord's Prayer, so we knew we were praying to the God of the Bible. See, Australia inherited the British system, and so we, we built our morality on the Bible, even though it wasn't a Christian nation. Not only that, but the teachers would read through the Bible during the year. So all the students would get to hear about Adam and Eve and sin and hear about the Israelites and hear about Jesus on the cross, the babe in a manger and so on. Here's what I want to suggest to us. Back in the 50s, 60s, Australia was an Acts 2 type culture. So an Acts 2 approach to evangelism from a human perspective, it works. People understood. But if you go to Australia today, it's like America, England, Europe. Creation is basically thrown out of the schools. They used to teach creation in the schools in Australia. The Bible, by and large, has been eliminated from the schools. They, they don't have Bible readings like they used to. They don't have prayer and assembly like they used to. In fact, back in the 50s and 60s, if you said to students in Australia, God, most would think the God of the Bible. But if you say God today, it's which God? You mean a Muslim God, a Hindu God, a Shinto God, a Buddhist concept of God, a New Age God? What God are you talking about? It's a different culture. I suggest to you that an Acts 2 approach doesn't work in Australia now like it used to generations ago because Australia is no longer an Acts 2 culture. Australia, I believe, has become an Acts 17 culture. When Paul went to Mars Hill, Athens, and he met there with the Greek philosophers, the Epicureans and the Stoics, and he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection, what was the response? Huh? What, 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 what does this babbler want to say? What is this all about? The response was foolishness. Remember, the preaching of the cross was what to the Jews? A stumbling block. But what to the Greeks? Foolishness. Why the difference? Well, you have to understand, who was he preaching to? Well, the Greek philosophers here, well, what did they believe? Actually, the Epicureans, they believed that everything evolved from the earth, that sensuous pleasure was the chief good of existence and so on. They were evolutionists. See, Darwin didn't invent the idea of evolution. He popularized a particular view of it. The Greeks believed in many gods, and the gods evolved, and we evolved. The Stoics were pantheists. Pantheism is another form of evolutionism. You know what that reminded me of when I went to Japan? I've been to Japan a couple of times, and the first time I went to Japan, my Japanese translator sat down with me and he said, look, when you say the word God, I can't just translate it as God because over here with their Shinto religion and many gods, they'll just see it as another God like all their other gods. I'm going to have to define who God is and define the God of, of, of the Bible. God that made all things and upholds all things by the power of his word and, and separate from the creation and so on. I thought, man, these are going to be long lectures. And then he said, if you tell them they're sinners, how will they know what that is? This is not a Christian country. It hasn't had a Christian basis. Also, evolution is taught as fact in the schools, just like it is, you know, all around the world. The problem is they don't have that foundation in God's word. They don't have that history in Genesis. They will not understand. And this is what he said to me. Unless you start at the beginning and define all your terms, they will not understand. See, I was going to a culture that had no foundation to understand the gospel. If you want to stay and uh, watch part two of this, uh, we're going to continue to play it. I know some of you probably need to get going in that. But uh, this, the, the, the understanding that comes through this video of teaching, of understanding the culture that we're dealing with today, I believe that every Christian needs to understand this so that your approach to evangelism, your, the way you minister, uh, especially to the culture in which we are in the center of right now, uh, I believe we can increase our effects of bringing people to Jesus Christ if you'll understand what this brother's saying. So we're going to continue to play the rest of the second part of it. Uh, you know, but I do know it's, you know, it's almost 12 o'clock. We have a 12 o'clock deadline here. But we're going to be here. We're going to play it. You're welcome to stay with us. But if you've got to go, you know, please uh, you know, do what you need to do. We, we love you guys. <laughs> it will be online.
What is the gospel? You might say, oh, well, the gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ died on the cross, raised from the dead. That's true. But isn't it also true that you can't understand the good news of the gospel unless you understand the bad news in Genesis? The bad news concerning a perfect world marred by sin, that the first man, Adam, rebelled and thus sin came into the world and thus death as a consequence. That's why we need a saviour. Here's what I want us to think about. Generations ago, our Western world was primarily an Acts 2 type culture one way or another. And so evangelists could come in and preach the message of the cross and people would understand. People, I want to jump ahead a little here, but America used to be an Acts 2 type culture. And one of the problems we've got is today, some of the older generation in the church grew up in more of an Acts 2 type culture, which is why they don't understand what's happening nor the approach that's needed. You see, for some of the older generation, to them, when they grew up in more of an Acts 2 type Christianized culture, and they might have believed in evolution of millions of years, but they're truly Christian, trusting in Christ, it didn't affect their salvation. And so here we are today and we're saying, you've got to understand something, it didn't affect your salvation, but you know what it did affect? How the next generation views scripture. And they don't understand what's happened. They were a part of helping the change of the foundation. Maybe unwittingly in many instances. America used to be an Acts 2 type culture, creation in the school, Bible in the school, prayer in the school. A lot of kids went to church programs. And so you could come in and say, you sinner, repent of your sin. You talk, talk about God, they would hear the God of the Bible. But people, America has changed. Like the whole Western world has changed. It, it's, it's no longer an Acts 2 culture. It's increasingly what? An Acts 17 culture. It's your own creation, Bible, prayer out of the public schools. You say, like in Australia, you say in America now to the public school students, God, which God? A Muslim God? Buddhist God? Hindu God? Which God? Years ago, generations ago, you said God, people would automatically think even in the public schools, the God of the Bible. And see, when you compare those two different starting points, a creation-based culture, they understand the terms. Evolution-based culture, don't understand the terms. To one, the message of the cross is a stumbling block, but to the other, it's foolishness. We have to understand something. The Greeks were on a whole different road, a whole different starting point, a whole different worldview. That road does not lead up to the message of the cross. And if you want that Greek to understand the message of the cross, you realize you've got to do something. You've got to get him off the wrong road and give him a whole new starting point, give him the, the, the right history, the right foundation, to get him on the right road that will lead up to the message of the cross. Do you know that's exactly what Paul did? Oh, it's phenomenal. It's all there. He looked around. I perceive you're a very religious culture, and so it's all their, their gods and, 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 and their temples. When I was over in the British Museum in London, one of the things I wanted to do was go in there and get a picture of the Greek gods. Here they are, the Greek gods. They're not very powerful. They couldn't even get out of the case. <laughs> There's the Greek gods. And so here's Paul, and he looks around. I was passing through and found this altar with the inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I'm going to proclaim to you. I'm going to tell you who this one is. He is the real God. He is the God that made the world. He's the creator. He doesn't need things like your gods. Your gods dwell in temples made with hands. No, no, not the real God. He defined God. Oh, reminded me of my Japanese translator. And he made of one blood. You're all related because Paul understood that history. He'll go back to Adam and Eve. That's why we're all sinners. He was laying the foundation. You know what that reminds me of? It reminds me of a mission organization called New Tribes Mission. How many of you have heard of New Tribes Mission? They've developed a chronological approach to teaching because they found when they went into a pagan culture and did what most missionary colleges, Bible colleges, seminaries tell people to do today, train our missionaries here in America to do, train our pastors to do. Oh, you start in the New Testament with Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and so on and you tell them about Jesus and just go right in there and boldly proclaim Christ. They thought they had all these responses to when they actually carefully looked at it and analyzed it, they found out those natives didn't have a clue what they were doing. They just did what the missionaries wanted them to do. So then they realized they had to have a different approach. So they did something so radical, it'll blow you off your seats. They decided to start at the beginning. What a concept. 
and they decided to present the gospel the way God does it in the Bible. Well, who would have ever thought of that idea? You know, when you buy a book to read, what do you do? You just read the last chapter. Who cares about the rest of the book? You rent a movie to watch a murder mystery like Sherlock Holmes. What do you do? You go straight to the end to see who done it. What's the point of watching the rest? You say, that's stupid. You've got to start at the beginning. Oh, why is it most Christians in our churches today read the Bible starting at the end? We're more concerned about the end things, by the way, than we are about the beginning, and yet it's the beginning where we've lost biblical authority in our culture and in our church. See, what Paul was doing in Acts 17 was taking them off that wrong road, giving them a whole new beginning, the right start. When Paul did this, then what did he do? Then he presented the Acts 2 message, the message of the cross. Talked about the resurrection. And look what happened. Three different responses. Some mocked like last time, but some said, we'll hear you again. Their hearts were opened and some believed. Wow. Now, here's the thing that really burdens me. I look at that and I say, that is incredible. Paul was going to outright pagans and some were converted. When we had 300 atheists as one group come to the Creation Museum, we knew you weren't going to get mass conversions on that day because <laughs> we, we understand the nature of who they are. But you know what? They heard God's word and they heard the gospel and we don't know how God will work on their hearts and minds, but it's so difficult to, to, to minister to those people. They're so hardened. And they actively suppress the truth and unrighteousness. It's, they're very difficult to witness to. Wow. Paul saw conversions. God, obviously, is the one that opened their heart and raised them from the dead. I say that to you for this reason. Do you know what many seminary professors, Bible college professors in this nation tell their students? I've heard it myself. And in fact, not that long ago, I picked up a little devotional booklet that's printed for a particular group of churches. Um, I found this one in the Michigan area, actually, for some of the Reformed churches. Oh, and I read one of the devotions, and I just felt like crying. Look what it says. Paul came to Corinth speaking the gospel in simple terms. He had just journeyed there from Athens where he had drawn on his education to try to communicate the gospel in the style of a philosopher. The result, the great missionary fell flat on his face. I can picture him entering into his diary. Don't ever try this again. The cross doesn't need my verbal decorations. Oh, Paul was so unsuccessful. People, that's what some seminary professors are telling students in America. Don't use the method Paul used in Acts 17. He didn't get many responses. Use the method in Acts 2. The method in Acts 2 requires an Acts 2 type culture to understand it. Paul was phenomenally successful. Do you know what Paul had to do? Using the terms Greeks and Jews as types, he had to turn Greeks into Jews. He was preaching people who had the wrong foundation. He had to take out the wrong foundation. It was like coming in to build a building like this. Somebody put the foundation there. It was the wrong one. We've got to dig it all up and start all over again. It's a much more difficult task. See, so start to think about this. Generations ago, when America was more like the Jews, our whole Western world was to one degree or another, preached the message of the cross, people by and large would understand. But you come into the present world where our culture is much more like the Greeks. Whole generations brought up in an education system devoid of the knowledge of God. If anything, Christianity, the Bible is taught against, mocked, scoffed, openly mocked in our culture. They're taught about many gods, and you preach the message of the cross and it's foolishness under them. Remember from one of the other sessions where I quoted President Obama. And one of the mantras of President Obama in 2009, 2010, whatever we once were, we are no longer. We're no longer just a Christian nation. We're also a Jewish nation, a Muslim nation, a Buddhist nation, a Hindu nation, a nation of non-believers. We know that the president is saying we no longer build our thinking on the Bible. We have a different starting point because he defines marriage as you can have it between a man and a man, a woman and a woman, and he, he actually declares that we need to support that. So we know what he's saying. There's a change. But what he's really saying too, it's a change from one God to many gods. In fact, in Newsweek, April 2009, in the article in Newsweek that we had on the front cover, The Decline and Fall of Christian America... They made this statement. 
The present in this sense is less about the death of God and more about the birth of many gods. Do you know what they're really saying? Whatever we once were, we're no, no longer. It was one nation under God, but now it's many gods. We're no longer an Acts 2 culture, we're an Acts 17 culture. Whole generations of kids now are going to the Greek schools. They've thrown God, the Bible, prayer out. They threw Christianity out, replaced it with the religion of naturalism. 90% of kids from church homes go to the Greek schools. And the Jews, if you like, as types from our churches are being turned into Greeks. And yet, what we're doing as a church through our Sunday school literature, Bible study literature, evangelistic campaigns, our Bible tracts that we have, our Easter pageants, Christmas pageants, through most of our thrust as a church, we're not approaching them as Greeks, we're approaching them as what? Jews. That's why I've said over and over again, we have a problem. A lot of our Sunday school literature, youth group literature, Bible study literature, we teach Bible stories. All these wonderful stories in the Bible, but they go to a Greek education system, most of them, where they're taught, here's the real history of the world, millions of years, evolution, Big Bang, the Bible's not true, never was a global flood. They're being turned into Greeks, and instead of teaching them how to defend their faith, giving them answers, teaching the Bible as a real book of history that connects to reality, giving them that history, making sure they've got the right foundation, their hearts and minds are being captured by the Greeks. Turned into Greeks. And we keep approaching them as Jews and wonder why we're losing them. You know, 1 Peter 3.15, always be prepared to give a defense or to give an answer. We're not teaching apologetics. The Greeks are teaching our kids apologetics. They're teaching them, here's the reasons to believe in millions of years. Here's the reasons to believe in evolution. Here's all the reasons the Bible's not true. What do we do? Here's his stories, trust in Jesus. The Greeks are changing their foundation from God's word to man's word. And what are we doing? Oh, that's okay. You can believe in that. Trust in Jesus. You know what the Creation Museum and the Answers in Genesis ministry is all about? It's actually to take Greeks and turn them into Jews. It's to de-Greekize them. You might say, there's no word de-Greekize. So what? I made it up. I like that word. Here's what's happened. Generations of our kids, our whole culture, all of us have been Greekized and we need to de-Greekize. We need to be taking people off the wrong road and giving them the right starting point, putting them on the right road so they'll understand the message of the cross. And people, it's got to start in our homes. It's got to start in our churches. See, we've got a problem. The culture as a whole has become so much more Greek than like the Jews. But we've got a bigger problem than that. We look out there and say, oh, look at all the problems in the world. No, no, no. And you know what we should be saying? Look at the problem in the church. The church is not touching the culture like it used to. The church is not ministering to the Greeks like we used to because we've allowed the Greeks to invade the church. And you know what? One of the biggest problems we've got, most of the people sitting in our churches in America, even our conservative, evangelical, Bible-believing, fundamental, if you want to call them that, churches are Greeks. You know how I know that? Because I get into many of those churches and I speak, and you know what the people come up and say to me? Well, what about carbon dating? But does it really matter what you believe about the days of creation? We're a conservative church here and we're against abortion and we're against gay marriage, but, but, but does it really matter what you believe about dinosaurs and the Big Bang? And They're Greeks. They're fighting the symptoms, and yet they don't understand the foundation's been changed. By the way, it's a bigger problem than all of that. It's that most of our pastors are Greek to one degree or another. Some are much more Greek than others. But the bigger problem than that is most of our Bible college professors, seminary professors, Christian college professors are ardent Greeks. Producing pastors who think like Greeks. Continuing an approach to evangelism that's just approaching a culture as if they're Jews. You see, what we do, oh, it's more important to talk about end times. It's more important to talk about things at the end of the Bible. Genesis doesn't matter, and that's where we've lost the foundation. That's where we have lost the authority of Scripture. This is where the attack occurred. You know, when Billy Graham retired, 
And there were news reports about this on the BBC, CNN, and so on. I've had people say to me, who do you think is going to be the next Billy Graham? And here's my answer to that. He would represent, to me, an Acts 2 approach to evangelism. But an Acts 2 approach to evangelism really only works from a human perspective. I understand God's sovereign, he's in control, but in an Acts 2 culture. America has very much become an Acts 17 culture. I don't believe you'll see another evangelist like that raise up in this culture as it is today. Because really when he retired, to me, in a sense, it represents the end of the ear of the Jews because now we're in the ear of the Greeks. I remember when our script writers came to me and a head script writer, Mike, a great talented guy who's, who's heard uh, uh, my messages on this. And he sat down and said, now as we write the scripts for the videos and the signage and so on in the, in the Creation Museum, are we writing this because, uh, are we trying to reach Christians or non-Christians with the Creation Museum? And here's what I said. And he understood exactly what I meant. I didn't have to say any more. I said, Mike, you're writing the scripts to reach Greeks and that's how we'll reach everyone. And when you come to the Creation Museum, you'll see what we do. We first of all take you in and we teach you how to think. We teach you about different starting points. The two starting points, God's Word, man's Word. Then we tell you our starting point is God's Word. And then we take you in and, and teach you about that. And then we say, now let's walk you through God's Word to show you how it makes sense of the world, observational science confirms it, and present the Gospel based in that history. Oh, that's what the Bible does. I mean, it really does. You think of Genesis 3. Trusting God's word, not man's word. Here's the whole history of what happened. Here's the consequences if, 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 if you go the wrong way. It's all there. We need to be de-Greekizing. Can I, can I urge you, we need to start de-Greekizing our own kids. Actually, we need to de-Greekize ourselves. And then we need to be de-Greekizing our kids. And we need to be de-Greekizing our Sunday schools and our youth groups and our Bible studies. How can you go out there and de-Greekize the culture when, when the Greeks are in the church? That's why we're not touching the culture because we've let the Greeks invade the church. We need to get out there and invade the Greeks. You know what God said to the Israelites? Remember with Jeremiah, don't learn the ways of the heathen. You're there to influence them, not them, you. You know the parable of the sower and the seed. When the sower threw the seed out, he wanted that seed to fall on ground so that he could reap a harvest. And we understand the nature of the parable. There's different ground out there. There's a shallow ground, the thorny, rocky ground, whatever. Here's what I want to suggest to us. Generations ago, there was lots of ploughed ground ready for the seed, ploughed by the churches, homes, schools. So a sower would come in, and yes, there's other sorts of ground there, but there's so much ploughed ground there that when you threw out the seed of the gospel, it could take root, like it did in Acts 2. But now those same churches, schools, homes have actually allowed the enemy to come in and sow in seeds of destruction. And now the, the ploughed ground has, by and large, it's, it's, it's all but disappeared and cluttered by the rocks of evolutionary geology and the trees of evolutionary biology. And now we're out there and we're saying, well, this is the way we've always spread the gospel in the past. Wow, these weeds are getting worse every day. Oh, well, and we keep spreading the seed. But we allowed the enemy to take away the ploughed ground. And I like to picture where we're at today like this. Here's a bulldozer coming in to clear some land. And by the way, I have to be careful in some states where I show this picture, I get accused of being an anti-environmentalist. <laughs> and I just want you to know this is just symbolic. And the bulldozer is symbolic, the trees are symbolic, the smoke is symbolic. There is no bald eagle or spotted owl in the trees. <laughs> they might be on the barbecue over to the side, but they're definitely not in the trees. You know when the pioneers went westward, did they just get their wagons, put them in a circle, and say, let's throw out the seed and wait for harvest? Well, no, they had to prepare the ground, and it was hard work so that they could have the ground so that they could plant the seed and get a harvest. I suggest to you today we're in the same situation the early pioneers were because we've lost most of the ploughed ground. We have got to be pioneer evangelists to get the ground ready again so the seed can take root and there can be a harvest. And what that means is to come in, 
What that means is to come in with this bulldozer and knock out these rocks and these trees. And you know what that bulldozer represents? Where the battle is today, the answers we need to be able to defend our faith, the answers to the skeptical accusations of today, so we raise up a generation who have the right starting point, and thus the right worldview. Now, as we think about all that, we realize something. It's, it, you, you say, but I, I'm just so overwhelmed. Yeah. I, it just seems like an impossible task. But you know what? When the Israelites were to take the promised land, it seemed like an impossible task. And you know what it says of the Israelites? What God said to them? Little by little. We live in a culture today, if you don't get your hamburger in 22 seconds, right, I'm not going to buy it. We want everything immediately. You know one of the problems we've got in the church today? We're not thinking long term. And for many people, they're saying, well, the end's getting nigh anyway. Maybe it is, but maybe it isn't. We don't know where we are in history. I mean, you think things are bad? I don't think that the Christians at the time of the Romans when they were thrown to the lions and that would think things are that bad today. Now we certainly see things falling away. We don't know where we are in history. The Lord can come back tomorrow. It could be another 500 years. It could be another 100 years. It could be 1,000 years. I, you, you, know, you know what though? If we don't start thinking long term and say, look what's happened. We've got to get out there and start plowing this ground. We've got to de-Greekize our children and our Sunday schools and our youth groups and our Bible study. We've got to start in our churches. And, we start, and, and the more that people do that and the more we get this information out there, it could change a culture as we raise up generations who stand on the authority of God's word and know how to defend their faith and have a worldview to be salt and light. Well, I'll ask you a question. The four spiritual laws, I'm not against that as a tract or anything, don't misunderstand me, but is the four spiritual laws, is it, does it approach culture as if they're Jews or if they're Greeks? What would you say? Jews. That's right. Can I make another suggestion? I, I love to go to hotels where I see the Gideon Bibles in the, in, the, in the drawer there, and I love the work of the Gideons, and I supported them when I was a high school teacher when they were allowed to come in, which they're not now in Australia, to, to hand out uh, scriptures to the, to the students. But I have another suggestion. It's a suggestion. We tend to hand out Psalms, Proverbs, and New Testament. The cosmology that's foundational to all the gospel and all the doctrines and that counteracts the cosmology of the Greeks is not in there. Genesis 1 to 11. There's a suggestion for us. We have produced some evangelistic tracts. Where did Cain get his wife? Where'd the races come from? Seven seas of history. Is there really a God? How should Christians respond to gay marriage? You see, we produced a whole series of tracks that deal with a particular issue today that is Greek eyes the culture. We give the answer and then we present the gospel based in history and Genesis. They're gospel tracks for the Greeks. It might have suggest to us that we need to increasingly use that sort of approach in our culture when we're evangelizing the culture. Because when you go out there today to talk to people, they've got all these questions. You believe the Bible? Where did God come from? How do you know the Bible is true? What about carbon dating? What about millions of years? We need, we need an approach that treats them as Greeks. That's what I say to people. Go out there and start de-Greekizing. That's what we need to do.